Greetings from beautiful downtown Hebo. Um, well, unfortunately, you know, this week I don't really have any news about the community because some people tune into us and they get the news from the community from, you know, the greeting that I have. Well, I don't have any this week. The what? Oh, Donna, oh, yeah, the Hebo Market. Ah, correct. Hebo Market got a facelift. <laughs> good one, too, and much needed one. Yeah, good job. So, anyway, um, have you guys read something and, and you could basically quote it and all that stuff from the scriptures and, uh, and not really know what it means? You know, ever been there? You know? Yeah. So here it is this, this morning that we're going to deal with uh, Genesis 3.16. And uh, that's where God is speaking to the woman. And uh, he is basically handing out judgment upon the woman. Men are next week. Women are this week. You know? And if I'd really been on the ball on this whole thing, I would have handed this off to Crystal and, and let her handle it because, after all, she is a woman. And, uh, you know, women dealing with woman issues, good with that. A man dealing with woman issues. <clears throat> Don't get too upset with me over this. I'm just, you know, just I'm just, you know... <laughs> Just trying to, you know, help us understand uh, the scriptures here. But anyway, Genesis 3.16, it reads, To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall deliver children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. It's like, uh oh, you know, you see what I mean by I should have let her to handle this one, you know, and then I'd take next week, no problem, men, I can talk to men, but uh, well, maybe we should trade off and let her handle the men deal next week, and <laughs> you know, I'll deal the women, you deal with the men, you know, so anyway, uh, to kind of get an understanding on this, let's go back and take a look at uh, Eve being tempted. Okay, so uh, you know, look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, where it reads, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. So what we're seeing here is that Eve is looking at something, you know, and desiring something that is forbidden. The fruit was, you know, don't even go there. And she's taking a look at it. She's being tempted. And she's, she's seeing that it's desirable. It's like, uh-oh. It must have been sparkling. You know, maybe it was sparkling. <laughs> um, however, I will give you this little tidbit. It was not an apple. Okay, how do I know it wasn't an apple? Apples came later. Apples were not around at creation time. It just says fruit, all right? And we use it and be symbolic and all that stuff. Uh, and some even say it's not, you know, it wasn't the apple on the tree, it was the pear on the ground. <laughs> anyway. All right, you know, yeah, that's, you know, one of those, okay. <clears throat> so, so anyway, what we're having here then is that, that she is looking at it, she's being tempted, and um, this is not a good deal because it's really messing up God's plan for man and woman, you know, messing it all up. We were created in his image, and because of what happened in the garden, it messed up 
you know, their descendants, which we are descendants of, you know, Adam and Eve, and we're all, we've been messed up ever since, okay? It wasn't part of God's plan. What was his plan as far as men and women go? Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verses uh, 20, the last half of 20, and then verse through verse 22. But for Adam there was not a not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of uh, his ribs and closed it up, up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to him. So what we're having here is we're having a man and a woman, and in God's perfect plan, they were what? They were one unit working together in harmony. Okay? They got together just fine. Now, what do we see Eve doing when she is being tempted? You know? <clears throat> Did she sit there and go, Oh, Adam, what do you think about what the snake is saying? Uh, the fruit on the tree, what do you think? You think we should probably take some and eat it? If you notice, she did not ask Adam for his advice or his consent and what she did. Okay? Keep that in mind. Because now, carrying on throughout the generations, it's like this. Ladies, do you ever have a desire of your own that you're just going to go ahead and do something? You know? And... If he doesn't like it, so sad, too bad, you're going to do it anyway, and he's just going to have to get over it? Okay? It's like, yeah, so much for unity, right? So much for harmony? It's, it's not there. So, what do we have now? Now we have three judgments that were given upon Eve. Number one was great pain in childbirth. Okay? Number two is a desire for her husband. And the third one is her husband would rule over her. You know what? This wasn't how God planned it. He, that's not how he planned the relationship. But when sin came into it, everything was thrown out of harmony, and now there's a whole bunch of garbage going on. Okay? That's why Jesus had to come and try to restore harmony to a world that is basically corrupt. Now, <clears throat> women were to give, when, the, when you give birth to a baby, all right? If, guys, if you ever uh, get around a, a woman who is in, uh, having, you know, in childbirth, um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> a little screaming goes on, you know, it's a real good time to have, you know, cotton and just stick in your ears because, you know, she can raise the roof off of the hospital. Um, it's like, whoa, lots of pain that they go through. Well, is that the way God originally designed it? Apparently it wasn't because it's part of the judgment. So when you look back uh, at Genesis chapter 1, because now I have a, a different understanding of Genesis 1.28, where it reads, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. Whoa! Babies, no problem. How many you want? You know? Just like clockwork, right? You know? They could, they could produce a ton of babies, and it would be no problem. They were being fruitful. They were multiplying. That's part of the blessing. Babies are part of the blessing. Oh, has that been twisted? You know? Now we're having to deal with abortion issues all over the place. 
Okay? Not only are babies being aborted, but you can go visions, dreams, your future, your future plans. We're great at aborting things. That's why we move around so much. You know? We abort what is going on in our life in this area. We abort it and we go someplace else. Oh, it's going to be so much better on the other side of the river. You know? All that stuff. That's the future. We have a plan for the future. We have, you know, and we're going in the future. Babies are a part of the future. And what do we do? We've been aborting them. Now I'll tell you this. This country is going to pay for all the abortions that have taken place. All the other stuff that is going on, you know, it, you can really uh, take a back seat to the abortions that have taken place. Okay? Now, so it's good this morning, because that was great. <clears throat> you know, um, guy went to heaven for, what, 11 hours? And was shown um, the, um, basically a nursery, or, you know, showing the kids and um, those that have um, been aborted or uh, miscarriage. Um, you know, they're, all those little ones are going to be there. And... Uh, and when we get there, we'll get to take care of them and help them grow up. Cool, you know? That's awesome. You know? So, awesome stuff. <clears throat> but, you know, it's good, you know? But abortion is just really doing away with the blessings of the future, aborting the whole thing, messing us up. Now, <clears throat> this, this next part, this is the one that I had to kind of wrestle through a little bit. Like I said, you know, not understanding something. Because when you sit there and you look at it and go, oh, she's going to desire her husband. I hope she desires her husband. Because what do we tend to do? We, take, we, stand, we tend to look at the sexual side of things. It's like, it's not what it's talking about. Different desire. Different desire, okay? <clears throat> so, um, <laughs> here's how the New Living Translation translates the scripture. All right? You will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. So, instead of there being a mature love, a united, interdependent relationship where husband and wives respect one another and, and they're just working in unity. They have a common goal and they're just going in that direction. What we're seeing here from the scripture is that women are seeking to dominate their men. You know? Dominating, getting, you know, getting them to bend and do their will. Just, you know, that whole concept. See how, like I said, you know, I should have had Crystal do this. You know? So ladies, don't get mad at me because, it's, you know, this is what they're saying. This, I looked at a bunch of commentaries on this deal. and It's like, yeah, it's trying to control the men. Now, uh, trying to dominate men, and it, it, it even goes to the extent of uh, the desire to replace them or remove them, you know? Um, you know, so there's this whole conflict that takes place in the relationship to the extent that men will do what? Husbands will do what? They'll look for, um, you know, other areas, uh, other people who are willing and receptive to, you know, pat them on the back. You know? So, uh, what you end up having is in marriage relationships, the men and women, uh, you, you now have a bunch of conflict that goes on, and uh, you end up competing with one another, uh, who's going to be in charge, you know? And what ends up happening in that whole 
ordeal is they're not working in unity, the harmony isn't there, and so what you end up doing is you end up divorcing. And that happens to Christian couples as much as those that aren't Christian. It's, it's a battle that goes on, and it all goes back to uh, Adam and Eve. So, <clears throat> now the thing about it is, uh, the Christians, who hopefully we are, you know, with Christians, uh, God has given us everything we need to overcome this. But I will say it takes work on our part. You know, we have to work at it. Now, the Bible gives us some, some instructions. Give us, it gives us an illustration of a marriage relationship that God intended in the beginning. So, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25, it reads, Wives, subject yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husband in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved on oh, that singular, by the way. I just want to clue you in. You know? It's, 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 it's yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're not, you know? Husbands, you know? It, you could say, husband, love your wife, singular wife, okay? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it. So husbands are to do what? But give themselves up for their wife, you know? So it's not all about us, guys, okay? It's, you know, really, it's not all about us. Uh, you give yourself up for your wife. What did Christ do for the church? He went to the cross, okay? He gave himself up for it. So, so I'm going to go ahead and close this out and get all from behind this and, and uh, be, before the rotten eggs and the tomatoes start flying too much. Huh? Well, he was... Yeah, he shall rule over you, and that is because she didn't ask him for his advice, for his counsel, or whatever. She just did her thing. And so because of that, now she is subject, she is to be submissive to him. And that's just part of, because of the way she conducted herself uh, with eating the fruit and everything. So that, so every every... Every part of the punishment has to do, really, with her and how she conducted herself. You know? And now, ladies, unfortunately, that's, you know, <clears throat> that you're dealing with this, you know, ever since. Okay? Um, so all these judgments were addressing specifically her and her disobedience and how she conducted herself. And so, um, going through each one. So what is the solution to this whole thing? Well, Jesus went to the cross for us, right? You know, he went to the cross. He rose from the dead. So the resurrection of Jesus. So the whole thing on this thing is to do what? How do you, how do you deal with the, the judgment that is put on, upon us? It's kind of like this. Jesus going to the cross, his blood deals with every judgment that is upon mankind and upon woman. That's, you know, including women and the mankind deal, okay? <clears throat> the human race. Jesus' blood, his shed blood on the cross deals, it cancels out every part of this. So we don't have to live with this judgment upon us at all. Okay, so how do you get through this? How do you bust through this in your own personal life? Be focused on Jesus. The closer you get to Jesus, the closer you're going to get to your man. 
especially if he is focused on Jesus. If he's not focused on Jesus, then you're kind of knocking heads. Okay? If both of you are focused on Jesus, it, it, it's amazing because the relationship is like a triangle. You have God up here, you have man over here, you have woman over here. Now, far too often, man and woman look at each other and go, Ooh, I like, you know. And you, you try to get close to each other, and you just, you just end up, you know, knocking heads and conflict and so on and so forth, okay. But as you focus in on Jesus, what ends up happening is you, get, you go up the triangle. And what happens when you go up the triangle? you get closer to each other. So the closer you get to Jesus, the closer you're going to get to each other. Now, is the enemy going to come in and try to mess you up? Oh, goodness, yes. He's been at this a long time. Hello, that slithering snake. I mean, you know, that forked tongue, he, you know, he'll tell you whatever to mess you up. You know? Don't go there. Do what? Focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. The closer you get to Jesus, the closer you're going to get to each other. Not, not only in a marriage relationship, but in a church setting. You know, as we focus in on Jesus, the more we focus on Jesus, um, quite frankly, we'll get along a whole lot better. There will be more unity, more harmony in the church. And that doesn't mean that we all have to think alike. Heaven forbid you think, think like me. That's, you know, I get bored enough with, you know, with what's going on between my ears. I kind of like listening to what's going on between your ears. More interesting anyway. So, what do we do? Focus on Jesus. Got it? That's kind of the conclusion of next week, too. Focus as far as, you know, focus on Jesus, you know. Amen? Amen. All right. All right. Especially in this time. Focus on Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for this awesome day that you've made. And Lord, uh, we thank you for you shedding your blood that all the judgments that are upon mankind are totally canceled out with your precious blood. And we thank you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen.